Red State Alabama elects a Democrat to the U.S. Senate. The credibility of the Mueller investigation takes a new hit. And there are new calls for the president to resign. Will the Trump agenda be derailed? Former RNC chairman Michael Steele joins us with analysis. And later, the U.S. economy is humming and the tax bill is promised by Christmas. How will it affect you and your money? Financial expert and founder of the Ave Maria Mutual Funds, George Schwartz, will tell us. And finally, producer and author Devon Franklin will tell us about his new animated Christmas hit, The Star. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Michael Steele, George Schwartz, and Devon Franklin are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo, or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the final brief news from the world over this week. For the first time in 20 years, a Democrat has won a Senate seat in Alabama. Doug Jones eked out a win over the controversial GOP candidate Roy Moore, 49.9 percent to 48.4 percent. This despite a late push and backing by President Trump and party leaders. Democrats turned out in record numbers to defeat Moore. As for Judge Moore himself, the former Alabama Supreme Court judge could not shake lurid sexual allegations, some dating back 40 years. Some 200 or rather 23,000 voters chose a write-in candidate. Those votes alone were enough to flip the election outcome. The GOP loss narrows its Senate majority to 51 seats to the Democrats' 49. Jones is expected to take office in early January. There is some good news for Republicans this week. The GOP historic tax cut and reform plan was approved by a conference committee of the U.S. House and Senate. According to reports, the compromise measure keeps several popular deductions that were eliminated in earlier versions of the legislation. Among them, state and local taxes and interest on home mortgages are deductible up to a combined $10,000. Deductions for higher education and medical expenses are also in. Overall, individual taxes are cut across all income levels, with the top tax bracket sitting at 37 percent. That's down from 39.6 percent. The corporate tax rate was bumped up to 21 percent, much lower than the current 35 percent. At the White House, Trump was hopeful that a tax overhaul would get to his desk by Christmas, noting that the IRS could implement the new law as soon as February. We're going to make our tax system work for you again. We're going to make our economy work for you again. And we are going to make the American dream. And that's the real dream. That will be the dream that you want for your children and your grandchildren once again. Democrats continue to uniformly oppose the measure, criticizing it as a deficit-exploding corporate giveaway. Congressional leaders say a vote to send the measure to the president is expected on Tuesday. And Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has canceled a scheduled meeting with Vice President Mike Pence during his Middle East visit later in December. A spokesman for the Palestinian Authority made the announcement just days after President Trump heralded the U.S. decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. According to Abbas, the United States is no longer qualified to sponsor the peace process. A White House spokesman said Vice President Pence still plans to meet with Abbas, saying it would be counterproductive for the Palestinian leader to cancel the appointment. The Imam of Cairo's Al-Azhar Mosque and Coptic Pope Padros II have also declined meetings with Pence over the Jerusalem controversy. And a federal court has denied the Archdiocese of Washington's request to run its Christmas bus ads. As reported here previously, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority declined to run the campaign ad depicting a Star of Bethlehem scene with the caption, Find the Perfect Gift. The ad 
directs people to a Christmas-themed website run by the Archdiocese. Since 2015, Metro has said, or rather has insisted, they have a standing policy prohibiting the promotion of religion in advertisements, though they have, for a long time, run the Easter campaign by the D.C. Archdiocese. But in this case, the U.S. District Judge ruled against the Archdiocese, saying that it was unlikely the case would succeed on religious freedom or freedom of speech grounds. A spokesman for the Archdiocese of Washington said the ruling was disappointing, but they continue to pursue and defend their right to share the important message of Christmas in the public square. And with a recent clarification from the Vatican that some divorced and remarried Catholics should be admitted to Holy Communion, German Cardinal Walter Casper has declared that the controversy regarding Amoris Laetitia has come to an end. Casper, who has been the proto-advocate for Pope Francis on the controversial application of church teaching, also asserted that in his view, this is the only correct interpretation of that synodal meeting of the bishops and the subsequent teaching by the Pope. Pope Francis has said as much in a 2016 letter to the bishops of Buenos Aires. In an op-ed for Vatican Radio, Casper said, the painful dispute is hopefully over after the official publication of the letter from Pope Francis, where he declared that the Argentinian bishop's interpretation of the issue was correct. Cardinal Casper further accused the critics of Amoris Laetitia of falling prey to one-sided moral objectivism that underestimates the importance of the personal conscience in the moral act. He compared the question to the distinction in secular law between murder and manslaughter. I'm not sure I follow that. Vatican reform under Pope Francis is showing some uneven progress, and it's facing continued criticism on a few new fronts. This week, European financial evaluators from Moneyval issued a statement that in part commended the Vatican for financial reforms, specifically its efforts in flagging suspicious transactions. However, it was once again faulted for not prosecuting any money laundering cases. Initiated by Pope Benedict XVI in 2013, the Vatican has been attempting to shed its image as a tax haven for shady business practices and to comply with international norms on money laundering and terrorist financing. The Moneyval report repeated the main complaint made in 2015, principally that although the Vatican prosecutors were freezing assets when they received reports of suspicious transactions, they weren't following through with prosecutions. In recent years, more than half its 69 suspicious cases were closed without charges or an indictment. And not one money laundering case has come to indictment, much less trial. And a prominent sex abuse survivor is resigning from Pope Francis's Child Protection Commission, Peter Saunders, who had taken a leave from the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors last year, told the Catholic publication The Tablet that he is stepping down from the body in frustration at the slow pace of reform. Saunders did not mince words, saying, quote, I thought the Pope was serious about kicking backsides and holding people to account. I believe the Church deserves better on this. Saunders' departure means there are no longer any abuse survivors on the Vatican Commission. Stateside, the Archdiocese of New York recently announced it has paid out $40 million to 189 victims of clergy sexual abuse. The settlement was done as part of its Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. The program is part of an ongoing effort to, quote, renew contrition and bring healing to victims of sexual abuse by priests and deacons. According to the Archdiocese, the program is funded through a long-term loan and not through diocesan assessments, parish, or charitable funds. And some sad news to report. Franciscan friar Father Andrew Apostoli has passed away after a battle with cancer. He was 75 years old. Father Apostoli was a founding member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, a regular guest on many EWTN programs, including this one and host of Sunday Night Prime here on EWTN. Born in New Jersey in 1942, Apostoli was ordained a priest in 1967 by Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. 
And there's not been much mention of the fact that he eventually became the vice postulator of Sheen's cause for canonization. He even got me involved in the cause. And he first appeared on EWTN with Mother Angelica in 1993 with his fellow CFRer, Father Benedict Rochelle. Father Andrew Apostoli served as a teacher, a retreat leader, a spiritual director to many, including me. He authored several books and was a leading expert on the apparitions of Fatima. He will be greatly missed. I remember the first story I did on Father Andrew. It was the first story I did for the world over. We went to one of their friaries and he said, come visit, you can stay with us. Well, I didn't realize it was a homeless shelter and it was the first and only night I've spent so far not only serving homeless people, but sleeping and living among them. I thank Father Andrew for that and so many experiences. Please keep his family and fellow friars in your prayers. And may Father Andrew Apostoli rest in peace. And I want to draw your attention to a story you should know about. In Haiti, the Caribbean island nation was hit hard eight years ago by that devastating earthquake. It killed upwards of 200,000 people. Many of those citizens were too poor to bury their loved ones. An amazing group of men there have stepped in to offer some dignity to those still suffering families. Catherine Porter, writing in the New York Times, tells the story of Father Rick Frechette, an American priest and a doctor who founded St. Luke Foundation for Haiti. It's a charitable organization founded in 2000 to help the island's poorest. And Father Frechette and his team have been working tirelessly to collect the abandoned dead for a dignified burial. You should read the story. Uh, it's in the Wednesday edition, the December 13th edition of the New York Times, an amazing work of mercy. When we return, as sexual misconduct allegations explode across the country, 100 Democrats are asking that the president be investigated. Others want him to step down. MSNBC contributor Michael Steele joins me with analysis on the other side of this break. Stay right there. President Trump should resign. Uh, these allegations are credible. They are numerous. Uh, I've heard these women's testimony, and President Trump should resign his position. Congress should have hearings. They should do their investigation. Welcome back to the World Over. That was New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand was asking the president to resign over allegations of misconduct, and she's not alone. Will the president have this major legislative achievement secured by Christmas, his tax reform plan, and does the loss of that Alabama Senate race indicate a revolt against populism and his agenda? Here with analysis is the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, now a political contributor to MSNBC, Michael Steele. Welcome back hey, to my the friend. show. It's good to be Great back to with see you. Merry Always. Christmas. Sorry, I love coming Sorry here. to welcome you back here under <laughs> such dark that's, circumstances. No, this is a but, safe space. <laughs> okay, well, I, that's right. I, I don't hit, and I barely draw blood. Just no, barely. Very, just barely. Let, let's start with this. Hundred members of Congress, Democrats, have yeah. asked for an investigation into these sex abuse allegations being lodged against the president. Now, the president's side would say, look, all of these allegations were vetted during the campaign. The people heard them, saw them, and made a decision and voted for Donald Trump. This is over. And the president's denied the allegations. Yeah, I, that's partially true. Um, it, it's partially true to the extent that it was exposed. It was not thoroughly vetted. Um, it was not um, It really kind of dissect it. Uh, in many cases, these women were dismissed uh, by the president, then candidate himself, as well as others. So now you're in this new environment in which mm -hmm. uh, these women have decided to come back. And I have to be honest with you, I've, I was one who advocated that they should come back mm -hmm. because the way we've treated women in, in this circumstance before um, has has been unfair. So if you have an allegation, okay, let's, to your mm -hmm. point, let's vet, let's yep. vet this out and see where yep. it goes. Um, and so that's what they're going to do now. I, where I had a problem when I look at the, the Franken case, Senator yeah. Al Franken's case, they had promised him a due process. An ethics committee. An ethics probe. committee. And then in 24 hours decided, you know what, we just want you to leave. Back, Bob Palkwood got a three-year yeah. ethics committee and so, vetting. And that's, that's how you see the scales in this new Me Too environment, which I applaud and am very grateful for. But right now it's tilted 
heavily the other way. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, mm -hmm. people weren't, you know, paying attention to what the women's saying. Now they're taking literally what they say and they're running and saying, you're, you're done for, you take know, him off the air, take him a, off the If show. a woman in a workplace, any workplace, is touched inappropriately, groped, whatever the case yeah. may be, it is incumbent upon the employer to hear that complaint, investigate it, and remove the malefactor. Right. Sure. That must be done. Right. However, I do worry, in this climate, this toxic climate that has been created, and that with the political machinations happening beneath the surface, these women, these Trump accusers didn't just come out of nowhere, Michael. It was coordinated. There was a Soros-backed group, Brave New Films, that brought them out in a press yeah, conference. I mean, they appeared on Megyn Kelly's well, show. The and then were, the senators called for investigation. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, all but to the extent that, they're that I don't like. Well, yeah, but, but there is always some degree of coordination and, and choreography that goes to these things when you mm -hmm. have more than two. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that to, to your point that that's that was part of what we saw happen in the fall. Um, other things going on. You right in the middle of the Hillary Clinton email, James right. Comey coming right. out Letter and saying, and, oh, yeah. well, she's guilty. Well, but then she's not guilty. You know, so mm -hmm. you had that whole thing. So this kind of fell beneath the radar where we are now on the heels of Harvey Weinstein and, and that whole series of allegations right. where we're up to like 90 some women. Um, and all the subsequent uh, men who followed in that, in that track is a different space where these women who have allegations against the president are now basically going back to the American people and saying, we're not trying to relitigate this. We just want you to hear our case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is not going to result necessarily in the president resigning or the president, you know. Well, you have, four, uh, you have at least four senators who are probably going to run for president right. asking for President yeah. Trump to resign and a hundred asking for an investigation. You can ask all day long. You yeah. can you can do whatever you want all day long. The Republican Senate and the Re Republican House are not going to necessarily uh, open up this this door in that direction. Given the Roy Moore loss in Alabama yeah. and the tight margin in the Senate, might they lose control of the House well, or Senate in the next round? Or is does the map favor Republicans, which I've been reading no, the, in some... No, the, the, the map does not favor Republicans, and, and I think people need to get away from that Thank particular you. mythology. Uh, the the idea being they're in safe, mar yeah, they're in safe there, districts. There was up until probably about four months ago that began to change a little bit. And now, once you have uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, what we saw take place in Washington State and Maine uh, in the elections back in November. Those and are then, all of blue course, states, so Michael, Virginia's turned blue. No, it's Virginia not red actually, anymore. Virginia is a solid purple state, which in any given uh, cycle can be red or blue, depending mm -hmm. on who the candidates are and the messaging that's going on mm -hmm. uh, with the voters. Uh, and, and so the reality of Virginia is, in many respects, a microcosm of what we're seeing around the country, Raymond, which is why it is such a bellwether and such a concern. But even more to that point, mm -hmm. Alabama should be very concerning on this front. Mm -hmm. The president won, Al won Alabama, 63 percent, right? right? He had like a 60-plus some percent job approval. Right. 48 percent now. Yep. That's a huge drop-off. 48% support what the president's doing, 48% don't in Alabama. All right, mm. we're not talking Virginia. But Roy Moore, Roy Moore also was the worst of the worst well, candidates. I mean, this agreed. was a man so, lost twice. He should never have been the so candidate. So if that's the case, then why did the party put its imprimatur on him, and why did they well, put they their tried resources to put, behind him? They tried to put their imprimatur on Luther Strange, who the people didn't want either, and they forced a guy like Mo Brooks out of the but race. The titular that's head of the Republican Party is the president of the United States. Mm. And his, and his executive arm, meaning the arm that executes what he wants, is uh, Steve Bannon. Mm. And that was the guy they got behind. So it mm. doesn't matter what else happened. He ordered the RNC to put resources back into that race. The NRSC did not. The Senatorial Committee did not. They pulled it away, yeah. They pulled it and kept it away. So that's the problem. Uh, you cannot now go to the American people and pretend that that didn't happen, particularly given how so many women feel on the heels of Me Too. Mm. Let's talk about this uh, tax reform plan on the Hill. You have Marco Rubio now saying, I may be a no vote if I don't get more child care tax credit. But when you get these thin margins, one senator one can come senator. up and damn the whole bill. Yeah, well, you know, that's how it used to be back in the day, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to really kind of horseshoe and negotiate and do all those types of things. Um, I think Marco will come in line. I think that they will probably give him what he wants. They'll find a way to pay for it. Maybe the, the corporate tax credit goes back up to 22 percent as mm. opposed to 21. Uh, they'll work it out. Look, Republicans, and this is what I find most disturbing um, as a former head of the party and certainly as, as a Republican, is that we are willing to do virtually anything just to get a win. 
Mm. And I think we need to pay attention to what we're putting in these bills, what this legislation ultimately will do. In my estimation, my studying of what information we do have between the two bills, House and Senate, this is not a middle class friendly bill, mm. number one, because the middle class tax cuts go away. They're yep. not permanent. Mm. They go away, and they start to go away within two to three and years. And for your upper income tax earners, which are the people who pay taxes, Thank you. Those, they are going to get an increase. They're going to get an increase. So the reality here is in the rush to get uh, something on the president's desk that he can sign and everybody can pat themselves on the back and go home for Christmas, mm -hmm. I'm very concerned about what's in the bill. Uh, it, it may not be a real president. It could be a lump of coal. Oh, boy. For more than 40 lawmakers, friends of Paul Ryan, claim that in closed doors he announced that he is leaving in 2018. Oh, uh, you conspiracy, conspiracy theorists, you. Well, that's what we do here <laughs> in between the news. Uh, now, your thoughts on this. I mean, uh, Paul Ryan, is he looking to 2018? Here's the real question. Does he see an electoral disaster and say, you know what, I'm not going to be head of the minority. I I, I, I'll, so I'll step down. I'm out. I think, no, I think that's smart political analysis. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, I think a lot, I think, you know. You or has he I, just had it? He didn't really want to I was going to say, you and I both know Paul, and, I, and yeah. I think we both appreciate the fact that he didn't want this job to begin with. No. Uh, he is not. I mean, he's a leader, but he's not that kind of leader on the no. on the back end of po you know non non policy yeah. stuff. He's not been happy with the job. He, the caucus is unruly in so many respects. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> he's got a caucus he can't control, so, and that don't any longer look like Paul Ryan. Right, and they're, I think they're, 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 I think that move is for him to sort of find his way out the door. Who would uh, take so over? That. Who would be the speaker? Well, there you know someone like Scalise and certainly uh, the majority leader uh, McCarthy, yeah. like Kevin McCarthy, would mm -hmm. be in play because he tried for the post and got right. shot down because well he got a little bit over his skis. Yeah, uh, and uh, so but I think the 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 warm sentiment would probably be with. Uh, Congressman Scalise. My congressman in Your New Congress Orleans. In New Orleans, that's right. That would be, a, that, I wouldn't complain. I know you would. Okay, <laughs> let's go. Uh, I need to show you this video. Now, sure. Peter Stroke, mm -hmm. who we've been re reading so much about, the lead FBI investigator on the Hillary email scandal, um, who, who interviewed Huma Aberdeen, Michael right. Flynn, all these people. He was the lead investigator. He has been texting, or these texts have been released right. between he and Jane Page, who was his girlfriend, girlfriend mistress right. at the FBI as well. And it seems he was very anti-Trump during the campaign. This is a little bit of a hearing. The other day, this is Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, being grilled by members of the House Intelligence Committee. Watch. According to the documents produced last night to this committee, Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page referred to the president as an utter idiot, a loathsome human, and awful, while continually praising Hillary Clinton and the Obamas. These text messages prove what we all suspected. High-ranking FBI officials involved in the Clinton investigation were personally invested in the outcome of the election and clearly let their strong political opinions cloud their professional judgment. Over the past eight months, I've spoken with thousands of department employees around the country. I remind them that justice is not only our name, justice is our mission. That was, by the way, the Judiciary Committee, right. which I, I misspoke earlier. Uh, what do you make of this? Is it time to have an investigation of the, the special investigator? investigator? No, it is not. And un unfortunately for all of those who like to fla fan this particular flame, mm -hmm. uh, this is a lot of nothing about nothing. But it does show bias it, on the part fine. of Fine. He can agents. be biased. And he, he's out of the... He can be biased yeah. all day long, mm -hmm. all right? It doesn't matter, because unless his bias causes him to taint facts... <laughs> Well, then that's what you have to track down. Well, well, but now you have a number of these people. Yeah, I mean, you but have Janine Rhee, you but have I mean, got, but Weinstein, who's the, who's was the, the number who's the two. Who's the ultimate trier of fact? Is it the prosecutor? No, it's the it's the judge. It's, it's the court. Well, the, the so actual prosecutor, he, the if, ultimate judge if, here would be the president, who no, runs all of this. The ultimate judge here will be whoever he takes this in front of to get the indictments that he wants. Mm. All right, of which he's already gotten how many now? Mm. Three does or this four. Clouds, does this throw a cloud of, of course, suspicion that's over what the it findings? Does. It does nothing more than that, which is why uh, uh, you know Special Counsel Mueller took the initiative when he first found out about this, knowing what the politics of this would be, mm -hmm. and set them aside. You talk to any prosecutors and all the prosecutors in your audience mm -hmm. who watch, they know what they've said about 
people they're investigating. They've called them all kinds of names, and, and particularly um, in high-profile cases, everyone has an opinion. I know, but they weren't removed from the cases. Well, he, in but, this case, but he was he because was, it did remember, cloud he something. Was, no, remember, he was removed for one reason and one reason only, because of the politics that would ensue had right. he stayed on, because he didn't, he knew well enough this town mm -hmm. to know that people would make the kind of noise about it that they're, they're making, making now. Did Mueller rush to fill the ranks of his investigators on this probe without properly vetting them for this kind of bias or, or expression How do you do that? of bias? How do you got, you've got, you, you've got a, a, a room full of lawyers who work for you. The case comes up and you're like, I want the best on my team to deal with this matter. Mm -hmm. You're not going to sit there and go, so have you ever tweeted something about Hillary Clinton? Have you ever tweeted something about, uh, you know, Donald Trump? Uh, they, that's just not how that, those offices work. This guy does look to be like the Forrest Gump of, <laughs> of, of this investigation. He's there with Hillary. Now he's with Michael Flynn. Now he's with Huma Aberdeen again, and Wiener. I mean, he's everywhere. He's entitled to a personal opinion. He's entitled to share that a personal opinion mm -hmm. with whomever he wants to share it with. Okay. And, and, and unless there is direct evidence that he deliberately went in and manufactured evidence in the case. Well, that text about the insurance policy of the election. That's a pretty damning text that should this goofball get elected, I'm paraphrasing, you know, we need to have our, an insurance policy. Now, question is, what does he mean by that? I, I would bet, I mean, I don't know what he meant by that, but mm -hmm. I, well, I, nobody I, bet, does. I bet it would be something innocuous because at the end of the day, he's in the Justice Department. What insurance policy can the Justice Department, he, he's well, a lawyer. Queer, you queer the facts. Well, That's he, your insurance. But he's a lawyer. He's a lawyer. He's not, he's not a Rod Rosenstein. He's not the deputy. Mm -hmm. He's not... The, the man in charge, so he's not like he can make decisions uh, that would drive this case in one direction or the other. I want to switch topics very sure. quickly. Mike Pence, the vice president, was set to go to the Middle East. He's still going. He's delayed the trip a bit. Yeah. The Palestinian leader, the Egyptian leaders, um, the Pope Tuadros of the of the, um, the, the cops oh, will not meet with him. Right. Because They're of the declaration of, of Jerusalem as the, as the capital of Israel. Yeah. Was that a smart move in the region? Uh, the declaration. I support the declaration. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the way it was handled was not smart. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that uh, for the reasons you just cited, you want to get ahead of that discussion a little mm -hmm. bit, and you want to let people know what you're going to do, and you want to at least get them, even though you know they're going to be uncomfortable, you want them to be just a little bit comfortable mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. so you don't have the egg-on-your-face embarrassment of having your vice president come to the region and serious, important leaders decide not to meet Not them. to meet with them at all. Now, some have suggested this was a way to kind of shake everybody up in the region, yeah. that, that America's been holding this out like as what a he did. carrot for a long right. time, right. and they got nothing for it. Which is why I like what the president did again I like what I could like what you do I may have concerns about how you do it and how you do it particularly in, as you know uh, whether we're talking the politics of the Vatican or the yep. politics of the White House or the politics of the Middle East yep. how you do it matters yep. uh, if you don't want extra noise mm. shall we put it that way well you do it well thank, thank you, you Michael Steele thank you. Merry Christmas thank you for Merry being Christmas. here when we return financial advisor George Schwartz will join us to talk about the booming US economy tax relief and your money should you invest now should you pull out of the market we'll tell you the world over continues in a moment stay right there the cynical voices that opposed tax cuts grow smaller and weaker and the american people grow stronger. I heard one of our opponents stand up the other day and say, this is for the rich. This is for the people of middle income. This is for companies that are going to create jobs. This is for very, very special people, the great people of America. Welcome back to the World Over. That was President Trump promising tax relief before year's end. The U.S. economy is riding high. What's causing it? And how will the markets and your pocketbooks be affected? With analysis, I'm joined by the founder and portfolio manager of the Ave Maria Mutual Funds. Please welcome back to the program George Schwartz, who joins us via satellite from Michigan. George, thanks for being here. And happy birthday. I hear it's a big day. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you, Raymond. Great to be with you again. George, on Capitol Hill, uh, Republicans, mostly Republicans, are hoping to pass this tax reform package. It will lower the corporate rate down to 21 percent from 35 percent. What impact might that have on the economy? It's going to be positive. It's going to be positive for almost everybody, Raymond. There may be a few quirks in the uh, new tax code as proposed uh, that hurt the highest income earners. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, it'll do a lot of the things that President Trump has been talking about. And that is help the middle class. Mm. It's going to help corporations with that very sharp reduction in the corporate rate. It'll make them more competitive as a lot of Republicans and conservatives have been saying, make them more competitive in the world market. And the increased profits can be reinvested or invested in uh, corporate America in terms of creating jobs, adding plant and mm -hmm. equipment. And uh, I think it will help the middle class dramatically. And uh, I'm a Republican and a partisan, I guess, but I'm a longtime believer in uh, supply side economics as preached by my uh, my good friend Larry Kudlow, who is okay, a member but, of our Catholic Advisory Board, but, he's been but, pushing but, the White House. George, Larry, Larry Kudlow uh, has gone on record as saying he didn't consider this a real tax reform package because, in fact, it raises rates on the upper income. As you just said a moment ago, supply-side mm. economics is all about cutting yeah. taxes so that those in the upper brackets will then invest and start businesses. If you're raising the personal rates, yeah. won't that do the opposite? Yeah, it, it's not a perfect package, clearly. Uh, and on the other hand, it's not a, a package that looks like it was written by uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi either. Uh, it'll have benefits, but not as great as Larry would have liked. Mm -hmm. But uh, Larry has pushed for reduction in corporate tax rates, and that's mm -hmm. the key phraseology, corporate tax mm -hmm. rates. And if that drops from 35 to 21, that will be a very good positive for uh, consumers, for investors, for uh, corporate America. Um, working men and women, and uh, I think it'll supercharge the the uh, stock market and the uh, economy. The economy is doing well, uh, as yeah. you mentioned. Its uh, corporate profits are probably going to be up 13 percent this year, mm -hmm. and based on the tax cuts, tax rate cuts, probably another 15 percent next year in 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of that'll flow to uh, benefit Amer uh, Americans across the board. Now, the estate tax was not included in this program. In other words, I I under this bill, the estate tax remains in place, but the estate tax deduction will be doubled. Is that good enough for you? Should the estate tax have been repealed? I think it would have been uh, ideal if the death tax was repealed altogether. It doesn't raise all that much money and it only affects uh, a pretty limited number of people. And. Uh, the, the wealthy people that are most affected by death taxes or estate taxes um, have already been taxed uh, six ways from Sunday yeah. throughout their life. And to uh, have to pay taxes again after they die is ridiculous, in my view. George, uh, in your uh, analysis of this tax bill, what impact will this have upon investors, people that invest in funds like yours, uh, the Ave Maria Fund, uh, that see capital gains? Will this hurt them or help them? Well, uh, it's not finalized, I guess, yet, but uh, one provision is, uh, is harmful to long-term investors. That's the provision that's going to require individual investors to sell stocks on a FIFO basis, so-called FIFO, first in, first out. Hmm. So the oldest shares they bought of a particular issue have to be the ones sold when they start taking profits. Um, that's wow. distorting the uh, economics of investing, because most... Uh, Investors that have invested over the long haul have bought shares at low prices and then somewhat higher prices along the way. And uh, for, for a long time, people have been able to select which lots they want to sell of a particular mm -hmm. issue uh, and uh, to, to, their, to their tax benefit. But uh, if that provision is in the final draft or the final version of the, uh, of the bill and it becomes law, that will be a, a negative. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think a, a world changer or a, a terrible terribly drastic thing, but it'll be a negative. Yeah. Uh, you know, last time you were on the show in April, George, and we looked this up, the Dow was hovering somewhere around 18,000. It is now moving toward 26,000. 
Is that kind of growth sustainable? I mean, there have been record after record broken over the last few months as it continues to rise into places no one ever expected it to go. Well, as I've told you many times over the years, Raymond, nobody can outguess the short-term moves in the stock market, mm -hmm. and only a fool tries to do that. But throughout the Obama years, you know, the market went up, and people would say to me, gee, Obama must be doing a pretty good job. The stock market's going up a lot. And uh, I used to always say and still say that uh, if it wasn't for Obama's negative policies, the market would have gone a lot higher during mm. um, the Obama years, the Obama eight years. And actually now, with President Trump, in there, it's continuing to go higher, and I think it will go higher based on the policies of uh, tax reform, based on, uh, especially on the policies of deregulation. Under the Obama administration, um, the uh, Democrats really had the uh, foot of government on the neck of capitalism. Hmm. They stifled capitalism and hurt capitalism with regulations, especially regulations, but also high taxes and an unfavorable attitude towards growth in the economy. So with uh, President Trump in there now, he's unwinding a lot of those things and removing the, uh, the foot of government off the neck of capitalists. And uh, we're starting to see the benefit of that in the stock prices. And uh, if this tax reform is as good as I think it is, and it's not great, but if it's as good as I think it is, it's going to boost corporate profits and probably stock prices in the new year. Mm. No guarantee of that because, oh. as I said, no, nobody, including me, can outguess the near-term swings in the stock market. But the trend is up, and uh, long-term investors uh, should, uh, should do well in uh, well-managed companies, American well-managed companies, like the, like the companies we have in the Ave Maria mutual funds. Mm -hmm. Those funds are up, by the way, this year, up between 15 and 25 percent. And mm. uh, that may not happen again in the, in the new year, but it, maybe it will. Who knows? Yeah. Well, that, here's the big question. As you look at the trend, you've been looking at this for a long time. You've been watching this market go up and down. With it riding at these stratospheric numbers, is now the time to get out or get in? What would you advise people? I think I, I, uh, I've said before, and I'll say it again, any day is a good enough day to buy a good enough stock or a good enough mutual fund. And don't try to guess the near-term swings. Um, I don't think the stock market's a bubble. Uh, you don't? Some portions of the market are a bubble, and that's what... Uh, so a, one portion of the stock market is a bubble, mm -hmm. and that's the, uh, the index funds, the so-called passive investing uh, mania. And... Uh, that, as you probably know, is a situation where money has flowed out of actively managed mutual funds into the so-called passive investments or index funds and index ETFs, exchange traded right. funds. And those things are uh, r managed in a way that they, if they get another billion dollars in today into an index fund, they just have to buy those same stocks. And uh, the ones that are the big capitalization stocks, the so-called FANG stocks, keep going up because those index funds keep buying them. Those fan stocks are, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and uh, Google. And uh, they are high priced. Uh, we own none of those stocks in our, in our mutual funds on a valuation basis, plus mm. the fact that they're all offenders, what we call offenders. They all contribute to Planned Parenthood. Corporations mm. uh, contribute money to Planned Parenthood, the biggest provider of abortions in the world. Mm. and. Um, so we don't invest in those and, uh, for those two reasons. What, what the fundamentals do don't uh, warrant it in, uh, in our view. Before we run out of time, I've been reading in so many of these uh, financial publications, they're talking about Bitcoin and these cryptocurrencies. People are dumping millions of dollars into invest in what is essentially Internet currency. Your thoughts on this? A wise move or risky given that it's not regulated anywhere yet by governments around the world? I think it's not only risky, Raymond, I think it's foolish. That is a bubble. The Bitcoin is a bubble. It's, it's, the price of Bitcoin has gone up more than a thousand percent just this year. And I don't think it's a currency at all. I think it's a speculative vehicle. I don't huh. think it's a currency. I don't think it's a store of value. And uh, I would uh, avoid it like the plague. Wow. I think it's going to zero eventually. I don't know when. Yeah, well, that, it's like all these I mean, it's, it's all essentially a worthless commodity, if you will. So I don't know why. People are, uh, it's just the race to invest in it that's driving the, the, 
the price up, not the thing itself, because there's nothing there. Yeah, there's no intrinsic value. And it does attract uh, drug dealers and uh, other criminals mm -hmm. that uh, don't want to uh, have their financial transactions monitored or traced. But uh, it's, uh, it's a mania. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, a bubble. And uh, I would... Totally, it's not an investment by any stretch of the me, uh, mm. stretch of the word. George, we've, we're getting a lot of emails from people who are saying they want to get into the market. A new year, I'm sure you see a big boost in the new year because it's when people, you know, begin to invest. They think of, okay, I'm going to start anew. This is the year I make a difference in my life. What is the proper breakdown, if you will, in your mind between stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and and you know, uh, hard blue chip stocks what would you advise people well it all depends on the individual Raymond um, depends on their age and their investment objectives mm -hmm. but historically for the average Mary or average Joe the uh, the mix of uh, roughly 70 percent stocks and 30 percent bonds is a is a pretty good mix I think mm -hmm. and the stock portion the equities or equity mutual funds is the portion that will give you the capital appreciation over time especially if they're well-managed funds like our mm -hmm. Ave Maria mutual funds in the bond portion whether that's in individual bonds or in uh, bond funds gives you the stability portion and uh, the the bond portion should not be viewed as a capital appreciation vehicle even though for the past 30 years bond prices have gone up as interest right. rates have gone down but that's starting to change right now. Interest rates are starting to go up. Mm -hmm. Bond prices will be declining, especially the long maturity bonds. Mm -hmm. The bonds in our bond fund, the Ave Maria bond fund, are very short maturity bonds and very high quality and uh, would be not as nearly susceptible to rising interest rates as most uh, long maturity bond funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and George, But it depends on the individual. and. There are some who look at a fund like yours and say, now wait a minute, the heart of this thing is morally responsible investing, not necessarily the, the investment that's going to give me the most bang for my buck at the end of the day. What would you tell them? Do the two go hand in hand, or are there times where they are opposed, making, making a, a, a good return and responsibly investing your money? Yeah, we uh, practice what we call morally responsible investing, and that means we follow the advice of our Catholic Advisory Board who have asked us, that board has asked us to screen out companies uh, related to abortion, uh, companies mm -hmm. that uh, perform abortions like uh, uh, the secular hospitals, uh, companies mm -hmm. that uh, are uh, insurance companies that pay for abortions and so forth. Also, they've asked us to screen out companies engaged in embryonic stem cell research, companies that contribute money to Planned Parenthood, and companies engaged in uh, the distribution or production of pornography. Mm -hmm. So we screen those companies out and uh, it, it only screens out about 150 companies out of the Russell 3000, about 5% of the companies. And uh, our analysts and portfolio managers have had no problem getting very good investment results uh, with the 2,850 companies in the Russell 3000 that do not offend these core principles of the Catholic Church. Mm. And people ask sometimes, well, how can you get good investment results if you have to operate with one hand tied behind your back? Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. Most of those 150 companies that we don't want to buy uh, aren't ones that we would have wanted to buy anyways for fundamental right. reasons. Right. They either have uh, too much debt on their balance sheets or poorly run or have a bad business plan or mm -hmm. uh, just are not good companies to, anyways. So uh, we've uh, been able to run what we call clean portfolios without uh, offending some of these core principles of the Catholic Church and uh, produce good investment results for our, for our 100,000 plus shareholders. Excellent. George Schwartz, thanks so much for being here. If you'd like to know more about morally responsible investing, visit AveMariaFunds.com or you can give them a call 866-AVE-MARIA. Maria, George Schwartz, thanks again. When we return, movie producer Devon Franklin is here to talk about his new animated Christmas film, The Star. So stay right there. The World Over returns in a moment. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo.
Welcome back to The World Over. He's produced films like Heaven is for Real and is the best-selling author of The Hollywood Commandments. I spoke to him recently about his new animated Christmas film, The Star, which is a big hit in theaters right now. Here's my exclusive interview with Devon Franklin. The Star. Tell me about it. I know it centers around an animal, a donkey named Bo, at a particular moment in history. <laughs> Tell us about it. Yes, the star is the story of the nativity, but from the animal's point of view. So you, you, you know the story of the nativity, but mm -hmm. you've never seen it from this point of view. And Bo the donkey is the lead character, and he's the donkey that carries Mary and Joseph to the manger in Bethlehem. And he gets help from all of his animal friends, you know, Ruth the sheep and Dave the dove. And we have an incredible cast that have come together to help bring this story to life. Mm -hmm. Everyone from Stephen Yun to Gina Rodriguez to Zachary Levi to Keegan-Michael Key to Kristen Chenna with Kelly Clarkson, Oprah, Tyler Perry, Tracy Morgan, uh, Mariah Carey, Fifth Harmony. We have an all-star cast yeah. that have come together to tell the real reason for the season. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do the star. Mm. I wanted to put the real reason back in the season. Christmas is all about the birth of Jesus. And let me tell you, when you see the birth of Jesus in this movie, it brings you to tears. Yeah. And our incredible director, Tim Record, just did an awesome job mm. of preserving all of the scriptural moments to make sure that it aligns with history mm -hmm. and with the Bible. Devon, I want to talk more about this in a moment. But first, this is some interviews we conducted with some of the stars of the star. Watch. I play Edith the Cow in The Star, and um, although at first I wondered why when the writers looked at this cow, they thought, oh, Patricia Heaton, um, but I tried not to be offended, and in fact was quite impressed with Edith's role and her character. She's a little bit like me. She's uh, kind of over it. She's tired. She hasn't gotten any sleep. I totally relate to all that. as. Um, a mom of four who works a lot, and um, I just loved her sort of sardonic humor. It's really funny to be that character who doesn't believe this crazy stuff anymore, almost as, I wouldn't say Edith is hopeless, but she's kind of seen it all. She knows what life is about. She knows you're going to be disappointed. She sees the youthful exuberance, and she was there once in her life, but now she's done. And so to be able to be a witness to this miracle, um, that's the fun part of um, playing that kind of character. Coming to this story from a Catholic perspective meant that I really wanted to be faithful to the beats of the story that are given to us in the Gospels. And what was great about doing it from the animal's perspective is that we can do both. We can be faithful to the stuff that's given in the Gospel and also be creative in between the lines, so to speak, because what we're doing is we're pointing the spotlight on the characters we don't hear about in the Gospels. We, the Bible doesn't tell us what the camels are thinking or what the donkey is thinking, and that means that there's room for us to have some fun and be creative. The movie definitely focuses on the perspective of the animals, but we also put a big emphasis on Mary because Bo, the story of Bo, the main character, is also a story of his friendship with Mary. And, um, and in fact, down the road, we even see that Bo has learned to pray from his friendship with Mary. Um, and that is something that I think resonates with a lot of people of faith because Mary is not only a character from the Gospels, but is someone that we can have a relationship with now as our Blessed Mother. To, to get there, I think it really had to come from somewhere personal. So for me personally as a Catholic, I, I really relish the opportunity to dig deep into who Mary and Joseph are. We, we aren't given like a paragraph of character description in the Bible as far as who they are as people, but my task as a filmmaker was literally to put words in their mouth because we were writing this script and we need to give them dialogue. And so I had to feel that uh, wh where we were coming from with these characters had a biblical basis. What I find admirable in Mary's story is that she, when she hears the Annunciation, she's invited to be the mother of the Son of God. She doesn't ask, is there like a 20-year warranty on this? Like, what, what happens down the road? She just says yes. And to me, that me, that implies a character who just embraces the future and trusts in God, trusts that the future will be bright. And what's also great about that is it gave, gives Mary a little bit of room to grow because as the story moves along in the star, Mary starts to realize that maybe there might actually be sorrow along this path that God has invited her to do. And that's a challenge to her personally because it's not going to be as easy as she maybe thought it was at the beginning.
I think that Mary is a reflection of strength, the strength of every woman, the compassion, the empathy, the kindness, the humility, and she touches everyone that she comes across in this film because of her empathy and her ability to understand somebody's perspective and be able to care for them. She, like, she takes on others' emotions. And what's beautiful about her telling Joseph about um, her pregnancy is that it's done so delicately, and it's done in such faith that there's no question of silliness. I've actually thought about it often, the moment where Joseph is hearing about that he's about to have a child that's not his, and what that must have been like, you know, for Joseph to be processing that. Clearly, you know, this is a woman that he loves and that he trusts. In fact, this is some kind of celestial happening, and angels are talking to us, and this is not at all what I was intending my life to look like or be, and I don't feel able to handle this. How, 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 how can I raise the Son of God? How do I, I'm Joseph, I'm a carpenter, I don't, this is way above my pay grade. That's insanity. So, but there's also some comedy, I think, that, that you kind of have to play a little bit in that, otherwise it's just way too much to handle. Devon, tell me before I let you go, what was the impetus for wanting to tell this story this way? Was the project brought to you? Is this something you wanted to do and started the ball rolling? Where did, where did the first movement come here? Yeah, you know, I, I have committed my, you know, career and life to make uplifting content and content that can be inspirational uh, and that can continue to build, you know, in the faith space. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that I noticed was just untapped and underserved was animation. Yeah. There hasn't been a faith-based animated movie from a major studio since The Prince of Egypt uh, wow. almost 20 years ago. So I felt like that was an opportunity and it just so happened that starting that opportunity with the star just felt like the right fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, what better place to start than with the birth of Jesus and to show it from the animal's point of view. And this is the first movie from a major Hollywood studio to be a faith-based film told in CGI animation, mm. the first ever of its kind. Yeah. So I thought that was a great opportunity. And also the faith-based audience wants more family content. I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, I, I want more movies I can take my, my children to and my grandmother right. to and, and my family to. And I do believe the star is that movie. You can take everyone to this film. You don't have to cover eyes. You don't have to cover ears. Mm. It is a movie that will warm your heart. It will educate the next generation on the power of the birth of mm -hmm. Christ and it will inspire you to remember the real reason for the season. And I'm hoping and praying that the star becomes the holiday event this year at the box office. This holiday season, witness the story of the first Christmas through a whole new set of eyes. It's the wise men. Hide quickly. Oh. Ah. The other the way. Other left. Oh. From the studio that brought you miracles from heaven and cloud you with a chance of meatballs. Meet the unlikely heroes behind the greatest story ever told. Herod is up to something. Mary needs help. We need to save her. You're in danger. You need to listen to what I'm about to say extremely carefully. Do you want a belly rub? Bo. If you want to get to my friends, you're going to have to get past me first. Dave. I'm going to go find someone to poop on. <laughs> no, too big, too big. Ruth. Almost down. One more chasm. Uh-oh. Well, didn't exactly stick the landing, but that was good. And Deborah, Cyrus, and Felix. The new king's in danger. Run for your life! Get out of the way! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah! Here's a little well-placed distraction. <laughs> the Star. Devon Franklin's new Christmas movie, The Star, featuring the voices of Patricia Heaton, Tyler Perry, Christopher Plummer, and many others, is out now in theaters everywhere. Well, that is all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Now, if you're looking for some last-minute gifts for that adventurous reader in your family, make sure you check out Will Wilder, books one and two, as well as my Christmas special, Christmas Time in New Orleans. It's available at Amazon and wherever CDs and DVDs are sold. It comes in both forms. Next week is our World Over Christmas Extravaganza, my favorite show of the year. 
You do not want to miss that. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.